when we get to be science, it becomes interesting because then God thinks that they both think, and I think most people think, mm -hmm. that humanity started in Africa and, you know, uh, went to other places. But St. God sees it in a kind of uh, uh, essentialist manner where everywhere people have black culture. Mm -hmm. It's like a genealogical tree where you have some branches in Europe, some in Greece, and so on. Whereas uh, uh, other people uh, see this as, in terms of uh, reasons, reasons where, you know, human beings start in one place and they spread, and as they go to different places, they create cultures appropriate to those places and so on. So uh, they're not necessarily African. That's what we have. So they will see Africa basically as, you know, it, 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 this is, scientists will argue that Africa is the only place where uh, you can see the gene pool in all the races. Whereas if you just take Chinese, they will not have the gene pool in other areas, or you take European and so on. But if you look at gene pool distribution, you will see I don't know anything about this. Whatever that happens, <laughs> you see everywhere in air all the races. That's what people say. Uh, so, so how to theorize that? Saint God thinks that everybody is African. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, over people just think that uh, you know it can be a culturalist that <laughs> things are uh, rather defined through uh, the dispersion of the human race mm -hmm. and new cultures that are historic that keep changing, you know, that like European culture keep changing, even though some people do not admit that. Uh, so, so in fact, one of the, in, in doing uh, this kind of classes, one of the things that also become quite fascinating to me is that, yes, it's about African diaspora, but it also tells a lot about Europe. It tells them, because as you define African, you are also defining a relation to Europe. So that they have one relation to France, but a different relation to England. If you look at uh, Africans who were colonized <coughs> by Britain, and the ones colonized by Belgium, and, the, and then by France or Portugal, uh, you see differences because the production systems were different, uh, the uh, cultural systems were different, uh, but also uh, the judicial system was different. So that because of those differences, invariably, uh, for example, for the Francophone African, the major issue was assimilation. You know, uh, do you assimilate or you do not assimilate? Yeah. But then there's, like currently, then there's another issue, and it's not anymore that it's the Francophone uh, in itself kind of doesn't make sense anymore because mm -hmm. uh, it was an important thing at the time. Yes. But, but now, um, and actually not, not even now, I mean, yesterday you mentioned very quickly 1945. Right. And I, I don't know exactly, but I'm trying to research a little bit now on the Bandung Declaration, the first uh, yeah. declaration yeah. of the Northern Line countries, yeah. Yeah. which means... I'll talk Asia. about that tonight, yes. Okay, yeah. Asia yeah. and Africa. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's completely breaking the whole thing. I mean, yeah. it's really not any more Franco... Yes, not... North and South, please. Now, I'll talk about that because I'm, tonight I'm talking about a meeting. Uh, which took place in 1956, uh, which was the Presence African that we talk about in magazine. It organized a conference in uh, 1956 in Paris, and this cultural conference was supposed to be the cultural version of the Bandung political conference. So that's part of the theme of tonight's talk, anyway. So, because uh, uh, I mean, Bandung is interesting. Uh, in a sense that this is a conference uh, organized in Indonesia, Jakarta, uh, in 1955, by, uh, which was attended by people like Nehru, Sokarno, Shuan Lai, uh, you know, Egyptian leaders, the leader of Presence African, Richard Wright. Uh, and they went to that meeting to basically try to create a position for themselves in the world 
that the world then would be divided by the Cold War, you know, the NATO bloc and then uh, the Soviet bloc. So, and, and these uh, blocs at the UN were forcing everybody to align themselves with them. And they were saying, if you're not aligned, then it means that you are not aligned. There is no such thing as neutrality. So, you know, Swiss was a very important case in that. Sweden was a case at some point where, you know, when, uh, when cases come up in, uh, in the U, uh, UN, if you're neutral, it means that you're going with one group. So, to respond to that Indian and Chinese, the, the, the Bandung Conference actually uh, began, uh, the idea came up in Colombo. In Colombo, uh, you know, uh, Sri Lanka, where uh, Philippines and Pakistan and India met in 1954, and they decided to create Bandung. So out of Bandung, this is the talk I'm talking about to, uh, today. Uh, out of Bandung, uh, the idea came to create, to include Africa, basically. You know, uh, how do we include Africa in this discussion? Uh, but what I thought I level was, I thought you were going to ask another question, but yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah. but it's very curious because currently, I mean, this same year, we have in, Amer in South America, the Cumbre de las Americas, which is the America Summit, mm -hmm. of course, yeah. North America. That's part right. of it. Yeah. But um, they, are, of course, they have always rejected mm -hmm. the presence of, of Cuba. Yeah. And for yeah. the first time ever, all the countries, but right. Canada and North America, oppose Cuba. Again. Um, yeah, again. But all the countries said, okay, there won't be a next summit without Cuba. So oh, wow. next time you will yeah. see what you do. You yeah. come or you don't come. Right, right. Because right now it's completely reshaping. Right. Well, right. they begin to have more and more bargaining positions because Brazil is part of the BRICS. You know, first, politically, they have Venezuela on the left. They have oh, maybe five or six Latin American countries on the left now. It's not just Cuba, you know. You know the woman elected in uh, Argentina is on the left. Brazil has been on the left. Uh, Venezuela, mm -hmm. and then the smaller islands. So, so they have that bargaining chip. Uh, the other one they have is Brazil is part of the BRICS. Mm -hmm. so, uh, this is the five very big countries that are not part of the uh, that are not European. Brazil is not number six biggest economic power in the world. So they, they just passed uh, Britain. So I just to finish, and I'm yeah. sorry about it, yeah. uh, but the last, last thing is that <coughs> anyhow, all these declarations and all these summits come up with a do document at the end. It's one of the goals of the... Uh, mm -hmm. And what is funny, and this connects a little bit with Hamilton because he was uh, revisiting the human rights declarations. So mm -hmm. all these declarations at the end of the day mm -hmm. seem to be just like poetry somehow, mm -hmm. you know, so it's a little bit like, oh, man, how come we uh, take this for serious somehow? Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. You see the world changing, but at the same time, it's just for pure economic kind of uh, needs, or for yeah. Europe to keep the immigrants out, you know, they did mm -hmm. this changing things. Mm -hmm. like. No, no, but yeah, uh, now, you know, this new alliance between China, Brazil, South Africa, uh, India, they're five countries, they call them the BRICS. I don't know if you've been listening, this is in the news, B-R-I-C-S, the BRICS, if you aren't typing the, the internet. These are countries that are economically powerful, and therefore they want, <coughs> you know, people to feel their weight, mm -hmm. and that is bringing some change. Uh, I think in the case of Africa, Two things will happen. Uh, I gave it a paper recently on the obsolescence of nationalism. And the problem, in, uh, in all the African intellectuals were completely opposed to that. Uh, maybe I overstated my case. I was saying that the nation state in Africa is not viable. And I was actually based on, based on this, so, you know, the Fanon book. Uh, so, uh, people got uh, uh, worried because they felt that that's exactly what Europe and America want for the, uh, for the nation not to exist in Africa so they can do what they want to do. You know, if you listen to Jesus talk, that point of view is right. Because, you know, Jesus was talking about 
had the nation has not existed in the Congo because all these different uh, interest groups are, you know, mining the uh, the coal tank for cell phones, you know, they're creating chaos, you know, bringing slavery. I don't know if you remember that uh, part of his talk. He had a point, and that's what Africans are worried about, that if the nation does not exist, this is what's going to take place. Yeah, so my point is Africans actually, just like Latin America, they have two choices. They have to maintain the smaller nation state in an organized manner uh, and plead with the UN and the democratic forces in Europe and the United States to have national sovereignty, not have people just bringing guns and drugs and take the uh, raw materials. So that's one choice. But within that choice, here is my problem. The nations are not viable still because they're just keeping the status quo. They will never develop as they are. But if we were, uh, and this is the argument I did not make clear in my talk, if we were to have regional powers in Africa as opposed to these small nations, you know, if we were to have West and a West African power that is integrated culturally, economically, politically, then they have a bargaining position. Uh, if we had that in Central Africa, then the Congo situation would not be what it is today. But the way it is today, you just you know, you bring some weapons, you exchange it, and uh, you mine the, the minerals, and then the the uh, public perception in the media is that these Africans are incapable of self-governance. But people don't, do not talk about the diamonds, the gold, all the things that are there that everybody wants. People do not talk about this. So, you know, I understand people who say, well, we have to have the nation state. But what kind of nation state do we need to have? I think that's really the main argument here. <coughs> and to go back to your original question, that would lead us into Fanon and the topic. I thought that when you say Francophone and Anglophone does not hold anymore, that you are referring to another uh, emergence out of uh, negative, which is the local languages in Africa. In many of these countries, national languages, let, let's say in my country, French is the official language but only minority, maybe of 10 to maximum 30% actually speak, read, write French. You know, in my own family, a lot of people do not speak French. They know things like how much is this, and then it's uh, 20 francs, things like that, give me this water, but that's it. They, they communicate in African languages. Uh, Senegal, everybody speaks Wolof. Nigeria, everybody speaks either Hausa, Yoruba, or uh, Igbo. So the local languages are not only more predominant business languages in Africa today, but they are also people are beginning to write them. Uh, they are writing them, they are using them in science. Uh, I was in Dakar, yeah. I was in Dakar, somebody showed me on the computer uh, the, you know, because you know, com the computers have adapted uh, the alphabet of many languages. So he showed me how he uh, basically does his writing in Yoruba on the computer. So if I do writing of my language on the computer, I can only use the French alphabet and then do the spelling by using French letters, basically. But there is no such a thing as specific accents adapted to my language, but people are doing that in other languages in Africa. So uh, I thought that you were going to bring the language question up, because the la language question would bring us to uh, thinkers who, are, who came out of Fanon, uh, thinkers like Ngugi, what? Yongo. This is a Kenyan writer. He's a Kenyan writer who was a major novelist who wrote novels like uh, uh, With Not Child. I made a documentary film on him, so uh, I 
I don't want to bore you too much with all his uh, uh, titles, but he wrote uh, Petals of Blood, which was a major novel. And people are, wait, uh, people are waiting, I was talking to you about Nobel Prize yesterday, it makes many people nervous. This guy, because he, last year he was in The Guardian, he was set to be number three in line to get the Nobel Prize. So the poor man, I'm sure, was not sleeping. You know, he was waiting for the phone call. Petals uh, of Blood. Uh, there are also... Uh, well, let me not bother you too much with these books. Let me just get into the theory right away. Uh, he, he is one of the key phenomenon, and we'll get into that. Uh, Nguki, after being consecrated as one of the maybe number two, three Africans writing in English, this is all of Africa, included South Africa and everywhere, he decided one day not to write in English anymore, to only write in his native language. And so when you take a class on post-colonialism, for example, uh, he is one of the first names that was put there right away. Movie was, so you get names like uh, Edward Said, Gayatri uh, Spiva, Gubi Wationgo. These are the names who are the key people uh, who define the term, the concept post-colonial using Fanon's work, basically. Yeah. Uh, there's another uh, disagreement in regards to language. Uh, the, the field that I work in is crowdsourcing, and one of the examples that I use is crowdsourcing to kind of to warm myself up and understand what it was is um, <coughs> a service in Africa called Text Eagle, um, in which uh, they have, so there's a, there's a problem that as you cross borders and as yeah. sort of like things are moving around Africa, um, especially information, it yeah. can be difficult to translate into the African language. Yeah, exactly. And of course, it's also very difficult to get the infrastructure to allow people to, to type these things in and sort of like do those right. translations. Right. Uh, so what's happened is a lot of people have cellular phones, right? The, and yes. They send it's out really big in Kenya and everywhere, really big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they so, so they send out small little chunks, like 140 characters chunks of things to translate to people who know two languages. And they take it from the one African language and translate it into another one. Oh wow! And then through that, they get paid <laughs> with. They can they kind of use it for cell phone time, so like that pays for their cell phone. Right. Or they can actually like take that and trade it in for currency and then buy things with it if they want. This is brilliant. And why cell phone? is cheaper than computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the elections now, many things in Africa now, cell phones play a huge role. You know, this is a, I did not know this. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe you could give me more information about it because uh, it, it's a fascinating thing because in the technology, I mean, if it, those of us living in America, I mean, every two years they're bringing a new iPad. Mm -hmm. So they make us need new things all the time. When you can do these things with cell phones, <laughs> incredible. You know, uh, since I've started using computers, and I'm one of the dinosaurs, so I haven't started <laughs> using a long time ago. So many com uh, computers have gone obsolete, and I, mean, I used to have disks and lost them. So every once in a while, I think about it, a program, a, a text that I've written, I look for it. It's gone. Mm -hmm. So very much, if you're in Africa or India, these cell phones tell you you can do the same thing. So why are we reinventing new ideas every day? I mean, I do like, I don't have that iPad yet now. I think this is why they make you buy a new one. The new one, the screen, every once in a while I see on the plane people watching movies, it does look good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the reason, I don't know. But, so, so Ngugi, uh, Ngugi was younger. I can do Ngugi now or do Fanon, but they, they really go together because he's the one of the key people uh, doing Fanon. Uh, Ngozi Wationgo, uh, at, at some point at the University of Nairobi in Kenya, uh, decided that they should decenter the English language. And he has books like The Center and the Margin. Uh, he, uh, you know, he has incredible titles. Uh, in the English language letter, where he says, by decentering the English language, what I mean is that from now on, the English department in Kenya has to have the, the books in the center of the English department would be books from India, books 
from mm -hmm. the Caribbean, books from Africa, but no longer books from Britain. Now, these are simple, maybe academic reasons. You know, if I want to use this textbook, Sheer uh, Marshall does not tell me, no, you can use but no, it's academic freedom. So it seems very simple. But when you do it in Africa, and uh, by doing it in Africa, you uh, change the curriculum, political is an incredible decision. It is really, a, you know, so, you know, the academic freedom that we have here, that we take for granted in the West normally, can make major changes uh, in, in Africa, huge changes. And we really have to uh, pay attention to that. So, so when Gupi, uh, it was exactly 1971. 1971, he said, let's decolonize the English department. And, uh, you know, people looked around, they said, decolonize the English department, you know. He said, yes, from now on, we're not going to teach Romeo and Juliet. We're not going to teach uh, Conrad, you know, Heart of Darkness. But we would teach novels from Latin America, from India, from uh, Caribbean and from Africa in the English department. It became a big scandal. First for Africans, that's not literature. And, I, and I'll tell you the truth, when I was growing up, I did not know the Anglophone writers. Every Anglophone writer I know that Chinua, Achebe, Wole, Soyenka, Nadine Gorma, Koche, I knew them in the United States, not in Africa. And if you look at the Anglophone Africans, they do not know any Francophone now, unless they're really good intellectuals who are curious. So, when Gugi made this decision, first he was fired from the department. He was fired, and then second, he started theater, a local theater, in which he began to talk about decentering English. He began to say, let theater in our own Kikuyu language, not in English. And these local performance theaters become very popular because people who do not know how to read can come and watch your theater and understand because it's in their language. You know, as opposed to theater being something elitist, you have to go to in Nairobi is the uh, national theater building, something like that the British has built, and people have to put on neckties. You know, it's a big outing to go see a play. It's not even in New York, to go to the Lincoln Center, to go to Broadway. It's a major event. But if the event was put outside, everybody... So that this is, this is one was one of the discoveries of Mugi Wachiongo after reading Fanon. We're beginning with what happened with Fanon before going to, into Fanon. So I get to it. So Mugi began these uh, theaters, and then the theaters become political. He had a play called uh, I Will Marry When I Want. Something simple like that. Where, the, you know, the woman question, where women have to decide when and who to, whom to marry, as opposed to being, being given to somebody by their parents. He did that. He did another play called uh, The Trial of Dedan Kemati, where uh, the, the government is being challenged somehow. So they put Ngugi in jail. They put Ngugi in jail. Uh, he spent a year in jail. Because as I said, we take writing and expression for granted in the, in the US, in France, in Europe, uh, everywhere. Writing and expression is, you know, it's, you're right. I teach Fano in this class. You know, nobody say, why are you teaching that, that book? You know, we do it. Uh, if we don't like the book, we do something else. But, you know, but people don't say you cannot do this. But this is what they were telling you. You can't not teach Shakespeare in the class because all those African and Indian, Indian writers are not writers. That's not literature. The real literature is British literature. So they fired him for that. They, they play, you can't talk about government. They put him in jail. So he came out, he said, I'm, I'm going to write my novels, but they would only be in, English, in Kukuyu, but not in English. So he went into exile. And in the end of the year, he went to London first, spent years there, and then went to Kempu, New York. You know, he was my colleague at some point. 
and then he's teaching at the UC Irvine. And as I said, every year he's told that he's going to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so remember his name anyway. So we come back to Gugin Kadir. His story is fascinating. He's one of the only characters from Africa. This is also something we have to figure out. Why isn't Africa and African literature big in the in the curriculum of post-colonialism? Because post-colonialism is mostly Indian writing. You know, Indian writing to an extent, European, you know, uh, like American writing, because America was English colony. So when they say post-colonial, people are bringing American writing, but it did not catch on with Africa generally. But especially with Francophone Africa, people just don't know what it means. So those are questions. So to go back to to Fanon, what I like uh, for us to do is to to, to go back to this, this question of assimilation to use it as a, a guiding principle. Because what's going to happen is that of all these groups that I've been talking about, you know, Cesar, Fengo, Damas, uh, you know, Bissan, Bano is the most popular in the non-French speaking world. You know, everybody has heard of Bano, but Nassau of Fengo, or well, Senghor after he became president, some people know about him. Or Cesar who wrote some of the major books. But Fanon, he wrote other books, but these two, these are the two key books he wrote in French, in you know, a black skin, I don't know if you want to pass them around. Black skin, white mask, and then uh, uh, Wretched of the Earth. Latin America, United States, everywhere they know Fanon. And Fanon is not that well known in French speaking countries again. So how, how is that? You know, it, so my, my, uh, my intention now is to see how to position Fanon in that French speaking tradition, you know, and how to do that. That's one of the things that I'm trying to do. This man, uh, whose work, if you know the Black Panthers, for example, uh, Black Panthers, I'm talking about Hugh P. Newton, Eldridge Cleaver, uh, that whole San Francisco, Oakland movement uh, uh, in the late 60s to early 70s, you know, the Black Panthers, you know, they were, uh, the Black Panthers used the Wretched of the Earth as the Bible. They basically took all the principles on violence and different things out of this book. They, it was, they read it every day, uh, and they, they used the paradigms of the white city and the and the Europe uh, the European city that's the white city and the uh, native city. They took it out of uh, the region of the earth and the ways in which you find your your independence from the white city or you take over the white city. Uh, the violence, you know, book uh, you know films like the Battle of Algiers. Yeah. Okay, this is all coming out of this uh, wretched of the earth moment. And at some point, actually, after 9 11, people were. There is a small movement, but it's important nonetheless. Uh, there was a movement to ban books like this and films like the CIA was monitoring the people teaching this book and the Battle of Algiers. Because they do teach you how to be a terrorist in some ways. <laughs> Because <laughs> there, there is a moment in the Battle of Algiers where the French people uh, uh, begin to attack the the Algerian culture. They say the women wear a veil uh, and the men oppress them. Uh, so what did the Algerian do? The women cut their hair. They you know they white. They look like a French woman. So they look. They dress like French women. And they put uh, bombs in the basket or in, or in the pocket book, and they come to the border because there was a border. You know, I don't know if you've seen Battle of Algiers. There was a border, so they cross the border as French women, and they go and drop bombs on the French people. So the book, and both the books, and the not this book, but Fanon has other books that teach you that. But uh, Battle of Algiers, especially, they were teaching terrorism, but it also was just radical. People did not know that this could be used actually by 
terrorists in, in many ways. So, uh, uh, Fano was used uh, in, in Latin America, Fano was used almost everywhere, but in France, Fano was not used. It, the reasons are many. The reasons are many. I think we need to look at Fanon first as a Frenchman. He was educated from Martinique, born in Martinique, uh, around 1925. Uh, was taught in high school by Césaire. This is another thing that's important. Césaire taught him in Glissambourg. And then he, he did med uh, psychiatry in Lyon. So he did medical studies that I had in Lyon. And then uh, the black skin white mask is actually his uh, thesis. It's his thesis uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the degree of in psychiatry. And he began to practice uh, psychiatry, psychoanalysis. And this is the generation of Lacan. This is uh, you know, it's that moment, uh, basically, in French culture, the Piaget in Switzerland here, uh, but also uh, the Melanie Kleins. Uh, they were all trying to use Freud in a different way. And Fanon was interested in use applying Freud to the colonial situation, where he was uh, reading. Well, I think there are two, three chapters in Black Skin White Mask that should be of interest to you. Uh, one is. Uh, one on the Mayotte Pit, uh, Mayotte, I see who was in, in, uh, a Martinican woman who only liked the white man. So, he saw. Okay, that's the one. That's the one. Yeah, Mayotte, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So, so he's talking about her. And, uh, but in terms of alienation, alienation from her group from uh, her, her race, and always dreaming of the white sailor coming. So he did a psychoanalysis of a woman like that. That chapter is read a lot, especially feminists who, like Fanon, but who thought Fanon was just being uh, sexist in that chapter. They, you, know, they, you know, he did not apply this reading to Caribbean men who also like white women. So the main issue for him was the, the, the Caribbean woman. So uh, there are feminist readings of uh, that. Uh, in fact, there is a major Caribbean writer, a uh, woman writer, whose name is Maris Conde, who is from Guadeloupe. She said when she was growing up, uh, Fanon made her feel like you know, she was not a woman. It, you know, after the writing in this book, uh, when she read that, she was always ashamed and she liked white men herself. And she's always, uh, well, she married an African man once, but all her husbands uh, are white. So Fanon, he said, how, how do you think I'm supposed to feel? Fanon is telling me that I'm sick, I'm pathological. You know, because I like my white man, I'm pathological. Uh, you know, uh, so, Marie Condé's take on Fanon is interesting, but there are all of feminist take on Fanon. Uh, there is another chapter on Octave Manoni. Manoni uh, was a major, uh, a major, major French anthropologist who did psychology, Freudian application of psychology. And he studied uh, Madagascar and islands like that and came up with the thesis that the uh, Africans have a, a dependency complex. They need fathers, and the white man is the father, basically. That all the colonized people, you know, if you take the white man away, then there is a big void. They don't know what to do. So they have that dependency complex. And Fanon rereads that. You know, it's a brilliant essay in a way, because Fanon is deconstructing that anthropologist and talking about his colonial desires and wishes and he's projecting his desires onto the natives, basically. That chapter is interesting. And then our own chapter, the fact of blackness is the one used most of the time uh, by Saeed, by Homi Baba, uh, by many authors to indicate uh, blackness as a 
kind of, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, Lacan, uh, uh, Freud, the psychoanalysis, blackness is a kind of lack, you know, uh, where, you know, a child in the streets of Paris says, uh, Mama, Mama, uh, Le Noir, you know, so you see a black person, his head is a black, black person, and then uh, Fanon talks about how, you know, people go and wash themselves not to be black, people see black, uh, blackness as a form of amputation. You know, so it's this you know, amputation which is a sort of castration if you want. You know, that's how people saw blackness and how he wanted to uh, have to overcome that. That chapter is quite interesting if I, you know, let me see. <coughs> I don't have uh, the original version here uh, in, the, in the fact of blackness. This, there are several translations of this book. I read mine in uh, in French. Uh, but the, what is quite fascinating about it is that it's not for me. It's not actually the chapter itself. It's the use of the chapter in, in post-colonialism. You know, if you if you take Homi Baba's reading of it, for example, uh, in this book on black cultural studies, you know, this is mostly black British, uh, you know, I did this, I don't even know when, maybe 1994, something like that. Well, I would just look at it and be scientific, 1990. <laughs> 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 be more scientific about it. Let me see. No, it's not, it's 1996. Okay. All right, reserve, 1996. I mean, uh, Never ask me when I did something because <laughs> I never remember. Uh, but let me let me go to the Homi Baba piece and give you some of the fun, uh, his Pannonian reading of this chapter. Uh, Homi Baba has this essay called "The Other Question." It's probably his most famous essay. Uh, so uh, let me go to that on page uh, 87. Homi, uh, have you ever read anything of, do you know Homi Baba's name, by the way? Mm -hmm. uh, so some of you do, some of you do not. We're just doing it out of uh, trying to understand what Fanon is doing. Homi. Baba. Homi K. I'm going to tell you because he's an egomaniac. They didn't know you. Dude, what happened? <laughs> so, because uh, you know, he's a wonderful guy. Uh, been a friend for years, and but he's become a kind of. Uh, he's, he's a dean of the humanities at Harvard. And uh, you know, right before I left the uh, United States, he wrote me, I just raised 12 million. One person gave me 12 million for the university, of course. But uh, Homi Baba is a fascinating person, and believe me if I tell him that you know, this is a theory class and you guys did not know him, he would be excited about that. But let's see the thesis. He says, uh, his, his main argument is that when you look at when you look at post-structuralism and the construction, which are some of the, well, you know, in schools like this, uh, both the construction and post-structuralism are very important. You can take a class with Judith Butler, who are dealing with post-structuralism and the construction. You can take a class with uh, Avita Ronel, who are dealing with those. Those are the key thinking uh, tenets of X, you know, that dealing with this whole post Heideggerian to Derrida to the present, you know, they read Lacan and uh, they read uh, people like Foucault, and the, and the, ma and, and the main thesis uh, behind post-structuralism is really, you know, 
Structuralism was uh, a school of criticism at, uh, initiated by linguists, linguists, but more specifically linguists like uh, Ferdinand de Saussure. Ferdinand de Saussure, who was in Geneva and Paris, uh, Benveniste. And the argument was that you look at a text or you look at a world by looking at the way the world is structured uh, with a, they talk about signifier and signified. That's what forms the world. So you say, when you say tree, the tree signifies something. You know, uh, they say it's very arbitrary, you know, of course. We speak languages by saying this is uh, whiteboard, but there is nothing that should make it a whiteboard. But we have a convention that the sound will, uh, the sign will signify uh, the object. We have that. And then this was a kind of revolution in, in linguistics because it took linguistics beyond just semantics, it took linguistics beyond just syntax to begin to to look at the content and the structure of languages. And post-structuralism uh, had, uh, you know, uh, people, post-structuralists are people like Roland Barthes, like uh, all the way to Derrida in deconstruction, the people who <coughs> wanted to not only look at the structure of the language, but the psychological uh, implication of that structure the political implication of that structure, uh, you know, so sociological implications, but they began to bring in more, they made it richer. They made the study of structure richer, basically, you know. In, let's say in, uh, in Roland Barthes' case, uh, Roland Barthes, uh, he, everybody knows his name, Roland Barthes, right? He, I mean, he wrote major essays, but his major book is, uh, at least in my opinion, his main, major book uh, is a mythology, a book called Mythology, where he began to analyze myth in every culture, you know, kind of after Lady Strauss. If Lady Strauss is a structuralist, you know, Lady Strauss, for example, uh, if you apply structuralism to anthropology, Lady Strauss went to Brazil, studied them and said that you do not need to do a study of the kinship in Brazil and stay there for years to understand this. All you need to do is take all the stories of the Brazilians, all the myths, and you read those. And by reading those, you actually understand the society. So, so the kinship, the politics, the, the wedding systems, whatever you call it, are in the, myth, the mythology. So Roland Barthes, as a post-structuralist, began to read French mythology, let's say a soap that he used to wash his clothes, or let's say a car that everybody liked, or let's say the catch, you know, this, uh, uh, what we call it, rustling today, rustling on television. He analyzed things like that and came up with you know, deep structures that you never suspect. A uh, you know, brilliant writer, you know, all he has to do is pick up mythology and pick up, just read any essay. This is very smart, well done, but they're going beyond just the study of the structure to give you the mythology, the social, uh, social uh, meanings behind uh, simple things like a book cover. He will take it and then take a painting and look at the ideology of that painting in the society and link it to things that you never think of. Uh, then Roland Barthes became very important for people studying uh, cinema, photography, and other areas. Because uh, his writing is, at least in France, is very easy, very good, and you know, uh, very smart. Uh, so, so he is important in that sense. Now, and the deconstruction, of course, I mean, Derrida is the main person, and one of the sim simple, simplistic uh, uh, thesis behind it is that uh, every reading is, uh, you know, depends on uh, a blindness. You know, you see things like this because you don't see this. If you have seen this other thing, then you may, you know, so he 
developed his idea of difference based on that. Uh, you look at all of that, Homi Baba comes and say, yeah, you know, uh, these readings are interesting, but what they actually do is they, they reveal the presence of the other. You know, the, This becomes very, very important in post-colonial studies, post-panel studies, and the other could be anything like the native, the non-Westerner, uh, the uh, the black, or the uh, the woman in, in feminist studies. Uh, the subaltern, the proletarian. So the other is really uh, that which is not us it, in this study. So Homi Baba accuses the, the constructionists, the uh, post-structuralists, uh, for never dealing with the other question. And that's actually the name of the chapter for not dealing with the other question. And uh, let me give you an area where Homi Baba is talking about this. Uh, I find it, uh, I don't agree with any of these, by the way, but that's fine, we got to deal with it. <laughs> Alors, therefore, despite the play in the colonial system, where am I? Uh, which is crucial to its exercise, etc. I do not consider the practices and discourses of revolutionary discourse as the end or other side of colonial discourse. They may be historically co present with it. Now, this won't help us. Let me see. He said the difference of other cultures is other than the excess of signification. So this is where he is beginning to criticize Derrida and uh, post-structuralists. Uh, because you know Derrida always felt difference work at all. This is what's being said here, that 
I cannot represent any aspect of Africa. I can only speak for myself. I understand the criticism that I'm putting words in people's mouths. But it's radical for me that I cannot represent any aspect of you. You know, even though we are all human beings, we all share. You know, in Senghor's case, I can be you. You can be me. But see, we see we see the radicalism here. Where Derrida, but also guys who speak back, he said, that's an illusion. That's an illusion. I can never be you. You can never be me. You know, you see how this otherness is being cemented here. This is what it really, I mean, in the Anglophone world, this is the main thesis of otherness. The other is something you cannot speak for. So that men cannot speak for women, uh, whites cannot speak for blacks, and so on, and so on, and so on. You see, there are, there, this is, if you look at post-colonial studies, I think this is one of the major radical moments, the, the major moments uh, of the, the what they call in the U.S. the culture wars, you know, where people are completely divided in the English department. They hate each other. They walk, you know, you know, because the there are those who believe in that you know American cultures, American literature should only be based on the classics. And those who believe, no, let's bring in the woman writers in, let's bring the black writers in, and then they begin to, who can teach it? So, you know, first you bring it in, but then who's qualified to teach it, and who's not qualified? And then the war begins like, like that, and then it trickles down to, in the Congress, and the senators begin to vote about it. It gets in the New York Times. These are the issues, and they're coming out of Fano in many ways. You know. this, can the subaltern speak? Can we spell it with difference like this, where you can only put it off? It, yeah. That means, though, that we can't, like, I couldn't even speak for my brother, right? Yeah. Like, I can't. Yeah, radically speaking, yeah. I can't speak any yeah. from anything except for myself. Right, right. That, that means we're getting up completely out of same, same God. Mm -hmm. we, the, where. He said the other is, you are born into the other, you know, and everything, I can, you know, feel this chair, I can feel all these objects, already, uh, Baba, Gayatri, Derrida, they're saying, that's just an illusion, that's a complete illusion, this is one of the things that we've been told, it's an illusion. Uh, and then I'm, I'm exaggerating it by leading it to the cultural wars, by leading it to the Congress, because that's what we live in the United States. Those of us from the U.S., we know that these are the debates every year. Uh, the curriculum change in the U.S. is everywhere about these issues. Uh, I remember at NYU in, in the mid-90s, there was a move to completely uh, uh, restructure this curriculum so that well, some people are concerned that students were not reading the classics anymore. So when that discussion came up, some people become concerned that while well, there is, we have to read the non-Western, you know, the, even the concept, the non-Western literature. So they had the poor students because so they had a, a new curriculum that they call the math. I don't even know what the acronym of the math is. But whereby every student has to take at least one, no, two classes in uh, in the classics, one class in the non-Western literatures, one class, and so on. So instead of you know you shopping the the way the U.S. curriculum is, you shop, you like this class, you take it, you like that class, you take it, and eventually you get a liberal education. So we have at NYU now the requirements that are not just English composition or math or biology, but the requirement in the classes. Because the argument is that people are not well educated in America, but this has been, this is what's great about America, but it's what's also silly. Uh, the, the, the debate has been always in America that the education is not good. But the American win all the awards in the world. <laughs> so, so it's really interesting. They keep, you know, if you look at Harvard, they don't have like 47 Nobel Prize winners. One university. It's obscene, I think, actually. You know, it doesn't make sense. 
So, but every year the debate is, oh, the U.S. education is horrible. But it's politicians and political administrators in the university because I want to be cynical here. Because they want to make more money. They're always restructuring the curriculum every year to make more money. You are an educator, so Jack. I'm sorry, but... No, no. They change. When we're in high school. <laughs> yes, so they keep restructuring, restructuring it and so on. But this debate becomes interesting uh, at some point, both for feminism and for uh, for uh, black studies uh, and now post-colonialism. Uh, and you know, again, it's interesting in the U.S. because that's the way we do things. You know, we we organize in communities and we defend ideas as a community. And if you have enough voice for something you eventually get money for to do it. But once you bring these ideas in Europe, you really confuse people. Because the European is more or less hegemony. It's a white culture, that's it. So you can come and live with the assimilation and the white culture, is, you know, or you're completely invisible. We talked about this yesterday. But so you see, the, the the U.S. is saying if you make enough noise, you organize yourself, people will hear your voice. And then here they will say, then why are you doing that? We all the same. Why are you making that kind of noise? We all the same anyway. So yesterday we were talking, but we said yes, we all the same. But how come I'm not doing this? How come I'm yeah? I know. I mean, yeah, you understand the point about it, but. I've been living in Europe for maybe more than 10 years now, yeah, and so Spain, now Switzerland, and traveling passing a lot to France, are actually living in the south of France for some time. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, more because it's young people and living with, with people who are squatting and working in subcultural kind of movements. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's a common thing. I mean, we're connected actually. Our network is spanned from uh, here to the Patagonia somehow to the internet, so, mm -hmm. I mean, I know what you're reading, you mm -hmm. uh, kind of a, a, a line of uh, development, but, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to say. How do you, how do you, let's say, in the, in, uh, in Europe, how do minorities, of first of all, do you have minorities in this concept, do you have because you know, US, we have this. Yeah, well, to be, to be, if you compare with numbers, to be really minor compared to the ones in the US. But, as, no, but as a cultural group that's recognized by the government and the policy makers. I think it's a because, you know, I think another time, another reality, and the minorities mm -hmm. of the immigrants in the new a few Latin Americans, you were talking mm -hmm. today about, yesterday about. When the Sapatia <coughs> and the immigration control came in, there's definitely a group there that I think that I can um, yeah. call up. Uh, the hackers also. Uh huh. Coded, uh, squatting. See, I like that because this is underground culture. This is subculture you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But in the U.S., these cultures are represented all the way to the Congress. You know, blacks fight to have black congressmen, women fight to elect women, all the way to Washington. Right now, the hackers in Berlin, they managed to get to the parliament in Europe also. Are they elected? Pirate party, yes. Oh, very, that's nice. Very strong movement. I'd like to hear that. It's <laughs> called the pirate party. And they represent? Two, two persons. That's the brilliant. European so it means that Europe is basically becoming more and more like America. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You should think about that. <laughs> you mean that we are your future? What should we say? Not America, <laughs> but like the world is changing so much. America. How about it? Well, I guess the Switzerland is quite small. Yeah. Previously you mentioned that the case of a movie, movie and that he decided to go back to writing his own language, yes. You see here, um, they have so many dialects of German, so the different cantons are different yes. dialects. Yes, right, And right. they have no written. The Swiss German doesn't have any written. 
So they read the uh, mainstream German German. They then define German uh, from the TV, of course, in the school. Uh, and in the newspapers. Yes, but if you ask them to read them here, uh, I mean, also they don't have. Uh, they, they that's, yeah, that's when fascinating. They, when they yeah. test each other from mm -hmm. a different canton, right. uh, it's all based on phonetics and it's really crazy. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's complex also. It sounds yeah. like neutral, same people, white all, and... Yeah, but like, I mean, Belgium I understand, because Belgium, uh, ethnicity becomes so important that the, the country becomes ungovernable. I don't know if you've been following the issues in Belgium. Mm -hmm. They spent at least two years in a Uradic government, things like that. Yeah, the yeah. Flamand and uh, uh, the, the, the Francophone. So Belgium, ethnicity has become a big issue, but it's not an issue here. People just know it, but they don't use it politically. Do, do a French Swiss, uh, Francophone Swiss and Germanophone Swiss, do they fight over parliament to, to be represented? Or do they say, we work, you don't work, you are lazy, do you have those stereotypes like in Belgium? I cannot answer, and I actually don't invest too much energy on following them. I mean, I live here, but uh -huh. I'm not so uh -huh. much yeah. to, to, to it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know that they have this idea that it's all about the president and they rotate and um, they have elections for everything and their communities for everything. They call referendums every time. Mm -hmm. They are mm -hmm. voting almost uh, five or six times per year, you know, like uh, voting and changing the own laws, like getting into the Schengen or not. And right. All, all the time the referendums are all the time happening in this country. So it's not a fact. I mean, it's really well organized. Uh, right, right. Things for such a diverse country. Right. You right. want the train, you have kids talking in Italian. Then the tourist comes and they can switch to English. And well. when they are leaving the French, they continue in German. Um, if you ask them, they are they are gent gentle enough to answer to you. So mm -hmm. I'm very much surprised because in Spain it's separatism. Mm. They speak Spanish, but the Basque and the Catalan and the people from inside the country it's all the war. It's all the war. So right, right, right. No, no, I think it, this is important for us because. The more you talk, see uh, this uh, this book. Uh, when I edited this book in '96, uh, the Black British were surprised by the title because it's called Black British Cultural Studies uh, because they, for them the debate was not about black, around black or white. Uh, they, they, uh, they use a lot of fun, by the way. Uh, for them, the debate was around Britishness. Who's British and who's not British? Mm -hmm. You know, it's about belonging, citizenship, uh, identity politics. But this identity politics was centered around Britishness. Whereas in the U.S., uh, the, the politics are centered around the hyphen, you know, black American, you know, Latinos and so on. So, so, so when, when I was doing this book, uh, people were beginning to have America, uh, American literature in, in Britain. People were beginning to read, you know, Alice Walker, The Color Purple, Toni Morrison, June Jordan, but they were also reading Fanon. And they were beginning to have larger and larger West Indian communities in, in, in London and Birmingham and uh, Manchester, Liverpool especially. And these larger groups were having, and then they were having Pakistanis, they were having Indians and Chinese, and then subcultures like you talk about the hackers. So England reached the point they wanted to know how to deal with this. Talking about if you look at post war war from 1945 to the time we were doing the book, they had the, first they had the Marxist groups dealing with this situation in terms of race and class. You know, that how race defines class and class defines race, but they're always together. Uh, so they use race and class to look at the uh, at the working class identity of West Indian, uh, in the Indians from the subcontinent, the Pakistanis, and so on. And then toward the 70s and 80s in Britain, they began to have 
this while, you know, like uh, nothing here, or I don't know if you call them. Because in the U.S., this is a tradition. It, it was, was a tradition. They finally figured it out. But in the U.S., it was a tradition to always, every summer, the big cities begin to burn. Miami, Washington, D.C., uh, Los Angeles, uh, you know, uh, what? Things like that. They're historic in the Every summer, people say, police, you know, watch out, the blacks are going to burn the community, the ghetto is going to, you know, Detroit, Chicago, everywhere. And this began to happen in Europe in the 70s, in, in England first. They had nothing here. They had Bridge Bay. They have uh, Hansford. They have all these cities. They were burning because West Indian uh, youth in England were no longer youth of the emigre. They are now second generation and they were beginning to feel that the native Indian, West Indian, Africans, or British. So what's happening? They are looking for their identity in Britain. They are looking for, you know, issues of belonging, citizenship, uh, identity. What is, who am I? Am I English or am I just uh, uh, a foreigner here? And I was born here, I went to school here. When I was a little kid, I was treated like, Cute, I'm cute, I'm like everybody, and suddenly I'm 18, people are afraid of me. Who am I? You see, this is what happened in Europe. And when uh, Europe in England, let's stay with England. So when this happened, uh, new groups began, you know, post Marxist in a way, new groups, this is what they call the Birmingham School of Cultural Studies, basically. A new group, the groups began to arise. And these new groups were talking about a new coalition of all these youth that felt disenfranchised. All the youth that felt like they are not part of the system. So we're talking about the punks, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, blacks, Asians, uh, all the groups that really did not feel like they were British, that they were excluded, people who felt that they were excluded by Englishness and Britishness. They organized and they began to call themselves, whether you're Chinese or lesbian or, you know, punk, they call themselves black. They all become black. You know, so you can see lesbian white women, they're part of the black youth movement. You see every group, they all become black. So, in the 80s, the riots, the, the, the government too has to figure out how to respond to these rights. In fact, uh, one thing I have to correct is this. The youth call it uprising, like in Bob Marley. When they are rebellions, they call it uprising. And the police call it riots. This is also very interesting. You know, so you have rising versus uprising. I mean, riots versus uprising. So, uh, and the police, in order to, to confront the riots, they change their costumes, they become militarized. You notice, well, you know, you too young to notice this, because that's all you know now. But in my time, when the police is confronting the youth, they were not dressed in gears like soldiers. They were just police confronting the youth with clubs. But now they have these long boots, they have, uh, you know, uh, gears, and they have shields, and they have clubs. And so the police become most militarized in the city. This was well, in London, but you can see it everywhere now. Everywhere in the world. I mean, your generation probably take this for granted. But this militarization of the police in the city was scary to us. We said, what is going on here? So, and then they used to begin to, to begin a burn. They were not just burning the ghetto. They began to attack the police. So this become really interesting and uh, our book came out of this because there was a group of youth uh, in England because, because you know, all the, uh, the government has to solve the issue so they created two things. One was the GLC, the Greater London Council. And the Greater London Council, the, the role was how to give jobs to these young people, how to give them jobs and how to make them feel like they belong. So they, they had the Greater London Council, and then they created a television station that you know, that had changed now, but it was called Channel 4. 
So these are the two things that have came out of the 80s because the cities were burning and you have to give the youth something to do. And the U.S. was doing that a long time, you know, whether it is community colleges or whether it is job programs and so on. So you see the U.S. model moving into Europe slowly. And then Margaret Thatcher was the president. So, so the youth use Fanon and the police uses uh, the, the uh, the military system like they do in Vietnam and all these places, but they're meeting in Europe. Can you imagine the situation? So the police is saying, we need to get up. We need to, uh, we need to change the architecture. We need to change the city in order to face, to confront this situation that we have now. And the youth is saying, we need to fight for our rights. The punks unite with the blacks, the lesbian, and so on. So this was like war, like civil war. In fact, June Jordan, it, uh, a professor at uh, Berkeley, has a book uh, that the London police, I mean, the London youth was using. Uh, it's called Civil Wars. She's a, a big poet. She died now, but she has a book called Civil War. June Jordan, uh, if you want to check this. But it was a very influential book. Uh, Post Fanon, June Jordan. So civil wars are no longer in the uh, in the colonies. We're no longer talking about well, now we were, but you know, like Beirut or Vietnam or Hanoi or you know Bamako. We're talking about civil war in Berkeley, in Oakland you know, San Francisco. So it's that model that moved to, to London. And you, I, I'm not going to teach you anything when I say this move to Paris in the... Remember when Paris began to burn? They do have to find solutions. They so, you know, uh, Stuart Hall is very good because he says that this is all uh, the, the wars of positioning. So that what he meant by that, he basically is looking at the politics of representation how you, you know, you are what the television and the media say you are. Forget about what you are. That's what the war of positioning is about. If the government or the city is, you know, Bloomberg is able to define the youth one way, then that's going to be the perception of the youth by everybody. And the youth too has to be able to position and define itself in another way. So either through art or through whatever it is in order to, to to make it the general position. That's what they call, you know, the wars of positioning, you know, the wars of representation. You know, representation become more important than all the realities that were that you know. So the youth succeeded, you know, through corporal studies, through burning, uh, through Stuart Hall, through Dick Heritage. Uh You may be interested in this book, it's quite, a, maybe the time has passed, but it was very useful to us in the U.S. Because even though we influenced the European, the black British, they gave us words that we did not know, like this militarization of the police, or the policing of the crisis. But also, Dick Heritage wrote a book called Hiding in the Light. This was quite, you know, he, he, uh, he, he migrated to the United States and was a dean at Cal Art, actually, I don't know if he's still there. But it's Dick Heritage, H E B D I G E Heritage. Dick Heritage wrote this book called Hiding in the Light. And it's about the punks and the movement, the underground movement, the subversive movement of punks in London, and how they unite with the blacks, the lesbians, and all the radical groups, basically. And it's that, those, the punks of succeeded in defining the police as militarized police. And the police succeeded in defining the youth you know, as hoodlums, as lawbreakers, and so on. And th things like that happen. Uh, let, let me uh, go back to home and I'll tell you if I can find home here. He said, colonial power produces the colonized as a fixed reality which is at once and other, and this the other is this. So the colonial power produces the colonized 
as a fixed reality which is at once and other, and yet entire, entirely noble and visible. So, so it's, it's this perception, you are knowable, they know you, they, you know, like that, you, know, you know the native, and it's, it's, it's you know, but it's an other, it's not like you, we really are no longer in, uh, in Senghor here. Uh, So he's going to Fanon. He said, this brings me to my second point, that the closer and coherent attributed to the unconscious pole of colonial discourse and the unproblematized notion of the subject restricts the, effective, the effectivity of both power and knowledge. Now, the problem with Baba, of course, is that he was so dense. You read him. In fact, I remember in the New York Times one time, somebody just took a long sentence by whom he Baba put it. He said, you tell me what this means <laughs> no, in the New York Times. So that's what, but, <laughs> so, so uh, uh, if you want to play with it, just go and Google Baba, you will see. Uh, this makes it difficult to see power, how power could function Product, uh, productively, both as <coughs> incitement and interdiction. Now, would it be possible without the attribution of ambivalence to relationship of power and knowledge? And really using Foucault here. Yes. Using Foucault, but trying to make it different. Uh, I, I don't know. But, we, it, but we're talking about Fanon, so let me uh, keep reading it, hopefully you will get something out of it. Nor would it be part... Well, let me probably read the sentence, fragment of sentence by fragment of sentence so we can understand what he's talking about because it just is incredible. So he says, this brings me to my second point, that the closer and coherence attributed to the unconscious fall of colonial discourse and the unproblematized notion of the subject you know, in the first point, uh, he was telling us uh, colonial power produces the colonized as fixed reality. So you see, that's not problematized. That's what he meant later on by the unproblematized. So colonial power produces the colonized as fixed reality, which is at once and other, and yet entirely knowable and visible. So you. Does this make any sense to you or we shall talk more about it? The colonial power produces the colonized as a fixed reality. Yes. That makes sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then, as a fixed reality, which is at once and other. So this fixed reality is called him or them, whatever you want. Okay. Then, but in this parlance is the other. And yet, entirely noble. You know, it's noble because you always know your natives. Them, they are like this. You know, they don't. It's a noble because it's fixed. Right, yeah, yeah. So it's a very. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like, well, you like that, you right. have to change. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a contradiction of terms, though, right? Because it's like you can't know the other. That's the whole point of it. You can never know the other. Right. Well, if the other is dangerous, at least. Right. You can't know the other in that sense. Right. They yeah. Are yeah. They are like that. So, unless you want more, okay. So let's go to the second point, which is uh, this was on page 93, and then uh, page 95. He said, "This brings me to my second point that the closer, the closer and coherence to the knowability uh, attributed to the unconscious fall of colonial discourse." And the unproblematized notion of the subject rest restricts the effectivity of both power and knowledge. You know, it's hard to make both power and knowledge effective because of this state that we have put ourselves in, in terms uh, with regard to the other. More or less, that's what he's saying here. Yeah. Because we have already faced the other. The other is the other, can only be the other, and because of that, brings me, uh, this brings me to my second point that the closer 
the 60 EP1, and coherence, the knowability, attributed to the unconscious pole of colonial discourse and the unproblematization, problematized notion of the subject to restrict this effectivity. Knowledge and power are not effective, effectively used. This makes it difficult to see how power could function productively and as incitement and introduction. That maybe I should contextualize it in such, because only is deliberately, as I said, confusing. He's talking about, if you look at the definition of order in the colonial situation on the one hand, and then you look at the colonial discourse on the other hand, the discourse is, you know, <coughs> the ways in which the law, the economy, uh, the literature on the on the colony is what is called the colonial discourse. It includes all those. So the argument is that if you already know your other, you cannot have a good you cannot have a, a discourse that is going to bring you together. It's not productive. So your power is not effective in a way. Uh, so Homi Baba brings up a piece, a term that he calls ambivalent. There is always ambivalence in the colonial discourse. Uh, as to how he uh, attributes this to, to Fanon. Uh, nor would it be possible without the attribution of ambivalence to relations of power knowledge to calculate the traumatic impact of the return of the oppressed. The return of the oppressed is really the rejected. The oppressed lady, the, the wretched of the earth, uh, those terrifying stereotypes of savagery, cannibalism, lust, and anarchy, which are the signal points of identification and alienation, scenes of fear and desire in the colonial text. It is precisely this function of the stereotype as phobia and fetish that, according to Fanon, threatens the, the closure of the racial epidermal schema for the colonial subject and opens the ro royal road to colonial fantasy. Now, this is difficult, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can you read that one? No. I'm sorry. No, no, I think this is, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but if we... Can you again read the Alexander? From here, then yeah. turn the page. Uh, yeah. Okay. Some of it, I, I've read it all, but we, we read it to try to see how we, what we understand. Because he's really putting Fanon in the nutshell, uh, the record of the earth. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll try to begin with a paragraph. This brings me to my second point that the closure and coherence attributed to the unconscious whole of the colonial discourse and the unproblematized notion of the subject restricts the effectivity of both power and knowledge. This makes it difficult to see how power could function productively, both as incitement and interdiction. Nor would it be possible without the attribution of ambivalence to the relations of power slash knowledge to calculate the traumatic impact of the return of the oppressed. Okay. Yeah, keep going into the end, yeah. Okay. Those terrifying stereotypes of savagery, cannibalism, yes, and anarchy, which are the signal points of identification and alienation, seem the fear and desire in colonial texts. It is precisely this function of the stereotypes as phobia and fetish that, according to Fanon, threatens the closure of the racial slash epidermal schema for the colonial subject and opens the royal road to colonial fantasy. Okay, so let me put all the words that we need to uh, explain power knowledge, colonial discourse, colonial discourse, ambivalence. Stereotype, uh, fantasy, okay, 
So uh, I said the colonial discourse could be taken as the colonial policy, colonial justice, colonial knowledge, colonial uh, economy, production, all everything that governed communication of the colonials, who could call that the colonial discourse. So this become a sort of power on the one hand, but a kind of knowledge also of, I didn't put the other. And our, no, our knowledge of this other and our power over this other uh, become kind of stereotypes. Stereotypes is a cannibal, you know, I think you, you went through the different elements of this stereotype, you know, cannibal, can you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. stereotypes of savagery, cannibalism, lust, and anarchy, yeah. and then uh, things of fear and desire. Right. But at the same time, this power knowledge is very ambivalent toward the other. You know, because some of the laws are reinforced, some of the laws are not reinforced, which lead the other to live in an ambivalent situation. You know, that's why he is using ambivalence here. So, that, uh, can you read the fantasy part? Yeah. So the end. Um, it is precisely the function of the stereotype that's phobia and fetish. Yes. Okay. Or should it? Okay. It is precisely the function of the stereotype as phobia and fetish that, according to Fanon, threatens the closure of the racial epidermal schema for the colonial subject and opens the royal road to colonial fantasy. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I didn't put that in the uh, epidermal schema, the schemata or whatever. Uh, and then, uh, so, so, so what, what I see happening here, Fanon, Fanon basically, I mean, you know, Fanon is very clear when you read Fanon, it's not confusing at all, but Baba makes it difficult. Fanon basically is saying that uh, in black skin, white, because he's combining two books here, the black, he's combining the two books, but what Fanon is saying uh, in black skin, white mass is that the, the blackness of the skin, the epidermal that skin that he's talking about, the blackness of your, your skin becomes a form of amputation because you're not white. You are incomplete. Uh, you are split. You, uh, so that's how it registers on your psyche, according to Fanon. You know, you are cast. With, he doesn't use the word castration, but this is what, you know, something is cut off. It's like they, they cut your arm off. It's like saying, look at this man, he has no arm. So look at this man, he's black, something like that. So that's what Fanon is saying. Now, when the colonizers take that to the, uh, to the, to the colonies, and the, the specific place that Fanon is talking about here is Algeria. So, and we need to say more about this. Uh, in Algeria, well, first the French left uh, Vietnam in 1954. The French were the colonizing force in Vietnam <coughs> in 1954. So they left Vietnam in 1954 to begin a war in Algeria. Because the Algerians have begun to really uh, attack uh, colonial bases. So the war started in Algeria in 1954. And Fanon, who is French, who was trained in, uh, in Lyon as a doctor, who had already written Black Skin, White Mask, sided with Algeria and gave up on his French citizenship. So, you know, and when we talk about that, what happened is that Fanon, Fanon basically was very he was going first of all with this notion of blackness as amputation. He's a black man. Uh, he had already written this thesis, a psychiatric thesis, uh, where he talks about the, uh, the black woman and the white white man. 
where you talk about the, the dependency complex, where you talk about being black in a situation that we call republic, where everybody is supposed to be an individual and equal, and he's not getting that. Uh, I talked to Fanon's daughter, for example, uh, Mireille, uh, Mireille, Fanon, uh, Mireille Fanon Mendes France. When I first met her, she gave me her name. Mendes France was one of the big politicians in France. And France Fanon is France Fanon. And she's the daughter of all of that. I said, hi, my name is Mante. She said, I'm Mireille Fanon Mendes France. I said, oh. So it's like <laughs> punching me. <laughs> Excuse me. So, but Mireille uh, it tells me this story when uh, her mother had her, her mother was Jewish. The mother had her, Hanon got hit panic. He got scared. He got scared and ran away, you know, in the deal. So you're dealing with a person, because he kept saying, what are people going to say? What are people going to say? He was really worried about these issues, you know. He had a baby with a woman who cares about what people are going to say. But Fanon said, I can't marry you. What are people going to say? So he left. So this, so this is a man who's very perturbed. And this is what uh, the English-speaking world and the revolutionary world has now really seriously looked into. You know, uh, they took his theory, well, Freud too was per perturbed, so every big thinker is perturbed, mm -hmm. Nietzsche was perturbed, so I'm not saying he's perturbed for any unique reason, you know, most thinkers are perturbed, so if you start thinking you too, you'll be perturbed, <laughs> so you <remember> that, because <laughs> you're sitting in your room facing, so anyway, so it's this man who suddenly wakes up to a France that is racist. You know, a France that's not as assimilationist. It's a France that was in Vietnam, a France that sabotaged the Haitian Revolution. So he literally gave up his French citizenship, went to Algeria, became Algerian, and began to fight in Algeria. This is what the Fanon we're talking about. He went to Algeria and began to fight there, and the record of the earth that you see is a case study of his residence is staying in Algeria. Mm -hmm. So this is what we, you know, it's the contextualization of this. So that's what, why he's describing colonial power, colonial knowledge, colonial discourse, so that, you know, he literally defined, you know, uh, and everybody uses this. Uh, if we leave Tommy Baba, we, we go to Fanon, You get two cities. You know, you get uh, the, uh, the the city of the the white, uh, the uh, colonizers, white city, versus native city. Now, for Fanon, Fanon is, is very Manichaean, It's very dualistic. It's very it's dichotomized. It's not. These two do not separate. You know, there is always a body, a barricade here. You can't just go through it. So we're talking about Algiers, the town of Algiers, but every in Oran, every city in Algeria. So you cannot read Fanon by taking Algeria out of context. So you get the two cities here, and this white city knows this black city. So you can call this what Bobby is calling the other. They know this black city, and they project all the stereotypes on this, you know, the savages, the cannibals, you know, they're not like us, kind of uh, separation. And Fanon's whole argument, which is very simple, is how to, uh, how to liberate this native city against this white city, psychologically, economically, uh, you know, linguistically, how to liberate this white, uh, native city. So, uh, you know, he proposes violence. This is the only way to, because in order to be, you can't just get your <coughs> independence, you have to have violence, and that cleans your mind. So he proposes it. And this is what everybody is analyzing, but if you read Black I mean, the Record of the Earth, it's very clear, it's very simple, it's even scary. It's so clear it's scary, you know. But when you read it in theory, 
You know, Holy Baba is not talking about any violence here. He's talking about uh, how the white cities, language on the black, um, the native city, he, you know, uh, is full of stereotypes, is full of ambivalence, is full of, uh, you know, uh, desire and so on. But, it, you know, yes, the native does want to take the place of the white man because the white man has everything. You know, uh, so in doing that, what do you do? Fanon proposes violence, basically. So if you look at Fanon's discourse in, in black skin, white mass, this is what we're dealing with. The, the, the black is alienated. <coughs> uh, but also, uh, we we'll probably place to take a break, right? Yeah. Okay, we'll come back. Okay.